faith will fail Christ will hold me fast When the tempter will prevail He will hold me fast I could never keep my hope Through life's fearful path For my love is often cold He must hold
still just do like a few minutes of greeting one another, and then I'll come back up here in just a second and uh, start our sermon. All right, good evening, everybody. Let's go ahead and uh, have our seat. If you have your Bible, please crack it open to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. If you do not have a Bible, there's a bunch back there. You can use your phone, you can use your iPad. Or you just have the whole book of Philippians memorized, maybe. I don't know. There were um, 
That was um, a part of James' class in Bible college. One of the uh, options was to, if you wanted to skip the final, you could memorize the whole book. And people did it. I didn't do it. But, you know, <laughs> apparently, people can memorize the whole book of James. Um, yeah, it's good to see everybody. There's a, you know what? I have to just tip my hat off to everybody. With uh, Bob's email about the construction, I thought that was going to scare away somebody. To, oh, man, parking this or that or the other. And it didn't scare away a soul, it seems like. So. Great to have everybody here tonight. Um, tonight, we're going to pick up at verse 12 for just a bit of context, right? Since the end of chapter 1, Paul started exhorting the Philippians on what living in a, you know, a worthy way of the gospel looks like. If you particularly look back at verse 27 of the last chapter, he says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then he went to talk about unity. He went on to talk about humility uh, starting in chapter 2, verse 5, uh, Paul pointed up about, hey, you can look to Jesus, and he's like the perfect example of what walking worthy of the gospel looks like. And last week, we really focused on two main things. We focused on like the deity of Christ, and we focused on the lordship of Christ. Uh, verse 8 it focuses a lot about um, showing the obedience that Jesus had to God the Father, even though he himself is God in the flesh. And so it's that same train of thought we'll continue on as we pick up in verse 12, um, really talking about now our obedience. And so let's just take a moment to pray, and then we'll get into our Bible study. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much that you gathered us here today. And uh, Lord, we want to call upon you for your mercy and your grace, just in our lives in general, but also just upon this time in your word. We pray that you would meet us here, that you would teach us, you would instruct us would make your word come alive to us. Give us understanding uh, to what your word originally meant when it was written 2,000 years ago. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would have just not only a good historical and biblical context to it, um, would you speak to us to just have a really good understanding of how your word is applying to our lives here and now in 2023? Um, Lord, would you direct us as we go out to our workplaces, direct us in our homes, in all these different areas of our life, we want to know how to be proper doers of your word. And so I do pray we'd have a good head knowledge of the scriptures tonight, but I pray it's a heart knowledge, one that we just have the desire to practically live it out and honor you and be the witnesses that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, we're going to start by going through 12 and 13. It says, so then, my beloved... Just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. A pretty popular verses, and some verses that are often hotly debated and maybe sometimes confused or misinterpreted and whatnot. Uh, but what I don't want us to miss is the connection here between the obedience of Jesus that we read about in verse 8, and now the connection that Paul expects from us as obedience from the followers of Jesus in verse 12. Now, so if Christ was obedient to God the Father, then it would just make sense that the disciples of Christ would also be obedient. And by reading the verse as a whole, when we have this idea of it saying, working out your salvation... Right? It's directly connected to this idea and this theme of obedience that's just here all throughout the scriptures. So what I want us to understand is that obedience and salvation go hand in hand. Now, again, like, as I say that, for some, that could be like a controversial statement. What do you mean? Obedience and salvation go hand in hand. Well, uh, because we just know that a person isn't saved by their obedience, right? A person is saved by their faith. So to make a statement like that, there better be some way to back it up and talk about the balance of it. And so that's what I want, what I want to do tonight. And it's because the Bible constantly explains that true saving faith, right, is connected with and is inevitably evidenced by a resulting a life of obedience that follows it. And so it's not that the obedience is doing the saving, but it's like the expectation that you are going to see once a person is saved, that there will be an, an obedient life coming after that. Many times people like to quote, Ephesians chapter 2, where it says that we are saved by grace, through faith, not as a result of works. And I say amen and amen. But sometimes they don't want to just continue to read the very next verse, where he says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, 
which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're seeing God couple these things together with a salvation by faith, but yet with an expectation of working in our salvation. Uh, many times people will quote John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. But then they'll fail to go on just a few verses later where it says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So again, we have this one verse where it's very clearly stating whoever believes has the eternal life, but yet Jesus puts belief hand in hand with obedience. And so there's going to be a handful of scriptures that we're going to kind of go through that kind of reiterates this a little bit. But I want to be really, really clear. It's a genuine saving faith is has the result of like progressive godliness in one person's life. Never that it, the godliness is the measure by whether or not the person is saved, but we should hopefully be able to measure some type of godliness as the result. Right? If a person is claiming to be saved, but then there's like absolutely no hunger for God's word. Right? If a person claims to be saved and there's just no like growing hatred for sin. If a person is claiming to be saved and they have like zero growth in their godly living. Well, then if that's the case, it's like 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, the person needs to examine themselves to see whether or not they're actually in the faith or not. And even then, it's not this absolute statement where I'm just going around and saying, well, I don't see any growth in you, so you're out. You're obviously not saved. And oh, yeah, you, you don't hate sin enough, so you're not saved. Like, that's not what that's saying. But it's like saying, let me bring my heart before the Lord to really make sure that what I believe has affected my life, and it's not only a head knowledge. And so, man, I'm not trying to have anybody doubt their salvation, but I want everyone to know that the Bible does, in fact, teach this, that if you are genuinely saved, there will be this desire to obey God. I mean, that's really one of the biggest things that separates James when it says even the demons believe, they have an emotional reaction that they shudder. They, they actually have a fear in their belief, in their head knowledge, but there's no submission. There's no desire to obey. It's just strictly the wrong type of fear. And we'll talk about the right kind of fear later. So um, nobody except Jesus Christ himself will ever live perfect obedience. And so we will all fall short from time to time, right? We're talking about obedience. I mean, my mind immediately goes to the times where I did not obey. Uh, but not obeying and falling short doesn't mean that you're not saved. So I just don't want anybody to confuse what I'm saying here anyway. Um, but if you're genuinely saved, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit is inside of us, right? And so when we end up making that poor choice and we choose disobedience, well, then the Holy Spirit's there to bring the conviction, to scratch at us, to gnaw at us, to bring us back to a spot where we're uncomfortable with either the mistake we made or a blatant wrong choice to sin. We, we should not be dissatisfied and okay and complacent with that. If we are just going on sinning and then there's zero conviction, that's when there's an issue of whether or not we are in the faith or not. A true believer is not going to be able to just sin and not have any care in the world and have complete disregard because the Holy Spirit is going to be in there convicting us, drawing us to the Lord for righteousness. So this obedience is just a critical part of these verses. I want to make sure that I overemphasize, if I can, Paul is not saying that this is how we earn our salvation. Right, I think uh, a good way to maybe illustrate this is to talk about this verse kind of describes practical in implications of salvation. Like I was just thinking about how to connect this to other real life examples, and there's like practical implications to certain jobs that we have. If someone is a construction worker, a practical application is they will work out their job by building a house. If someone is a teacher, they're going to work out that job as educating students. Someone's a dentist, right? You're going to work that out by, I don't know, cleaning teeth, putting in a filling or something or another, right? But this is the, the same thing is true spiritually. If we're saved, we're supposed to work out our salvation by there'll be obedience to the Lord. It, the obedience doesn't come first and like create the salvation. It's the byproduct. So in that light, I want us to see what these verses are not saying. It does not say, notice, work out, uh, work for your salvation, because right, that would be a game changer. If we read the verse and it said, oh, work for your salvation, I'd be like, well, maybe we are doing this thing the wrong way. Maybe we better rack up the good works, right? But no, it very clearly says we're working out our salvation, not for. And so the implication is clearly the person is already saved. And the works the person are doing is testifying to this. So that's verse 12. 
But then we have verse 13 that even maybe complicate it just a little bit more. Verse 12, Paul's talking about it's our responsibility to work out our salvation. But then verse 13, Paul says how it's actually God who works in us to work for his good pleasure. It's like, so wait a minute. Is, is, am I the one working out my salvation, or is God the one working in me to work for him? Because I just read the verses back to back, and I'm reading both. So the answer is yes. That's the answer, right? It's, it's not either or, it's yes and. It's both of them together. And Christians have often been confused over the relationship between God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. And it is a hard thing for us to wrap our mind around. I, I get that this can be a confusing topic. At face value, they kind of seem to contradict one another. Like, how can both be true at the exact same time? And they will often get confused that you have to choose one or the other. And I get it, you know, uh, I come from the camp where maybe I want to maybe lean more towards one than the other, but I'm not going to come from the camp where I have to choose one or the other. And some people are maybe more balanced, and they're like, they're just dead on in the middle. And that's a very good spot to be at. I think if you're dead on, dead center in the middle, you're probably safer and just less controversy. And then if you're like me, maybe you do lean way, one way just a little bit more. Uh, no fault in that, but I think the fault is when you just only choose one, right? And it's because some have overemphasized God's sovereignty to the point where they exclude the human responsibility portion. And that's not a good thing, because in that case, that we don't have any contribution over to whether we're saved or not. And that may be your doctrinal position. That's the Calvinist position. And Calvary Chapel and I am just not Calvinist, so I'm not going to teach that view. I'm not going to say it's 100% wrong or unbiblical. Um, you can have that interpretation if you want. But then that's just like God is going to go around and just start saving people regardless of their participation in that or not. And it, it's a possibility. I just don't see that. But then on the other hand, you have some people that stress the human responsibility side so much where it excludes God's sovereignty in it. And in that case, God's just upstairs in heaven watching and waiting. You can't wait to find out who's going to be saved or not. Oh, I really hope Mike comes along and you know, accepts the gospel this time when he's like biting his nail trying to see what our human responsibility is going to produce for salvation. And I strongly, actually, I denounce that one 100%. I feel like you can be a Calvinist and still be halfway right, you know. But if you're over here by saying that there's just like, you want to take God's sovereignty out of it, I'm like, uh, you know what, I'm going to have to argue and agree to disagree with you on that one. Uh, so I think t taking to the extremes of both of these views about salvation are incorrect. I think that there's a middle ground. And that's what Calvary Chapel holds, that's where I hold. But then the same will be true with like sanctification, because that's really, in a sense, what we're talking about here tonight when we're talking about working out our salvation. We're talking about this idea of obedience and growing in obedience. It's our spiritual growth, our sanctification. Some will overemphasize God's sovereignty, where spiritual growth and sanctification is just this passive process on our end. And a person just gets saved because God saved them, and then it's just kind of a roll of the dice, and we just kind of wait and see what kind of Christian God's Spirit molds us to be as he inhabits each individual Christian. And, well, on the other hand, some people overemphasize human responsibility to where they exclude God's interaction and God's help in the spiritual growth of a believer. And so what that ends up kind of playing out is people grow and only trust in their own strength for their sanctification and for their spiritual growth. And then when you're doing that, that's just going to lead to a person being prideful. Look how much I've spiritually grown myself. And then I'm so much more spiritually mature than this other person because I've done it. And or then it could be the opposite. We're like, man, I, I just wish I was as spiritual as my wife. And now I'm like, I just have all this condemnation because I'm just the worst person in the world because I, I can't seem to do it. I don't have the power within me. And it's all, it's all on me. And now there's a lot of condemnation in that. So taking to the extremes, I think the view of sanctification like that is incorrect. Uh, the bottom line is we have to look at this. If you deny the sovereignty of God, it's unbiblical. And then if you deny man's responsibility, it's also unbiblical. It's not either or, it teaches both. And so we've got to strike a balance between this. And it's not just us that is striking a balance. Like we see this in other parts of the Bible. Look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. Jesus says the words, hey, offenses must come. They must. It's, a, it's an issue of the sovereignty of God. It's an unavoidable thing that God has already predetermined. Offenses are going to be in this world. But right after that, he says, but woe unto the person which the offense comes. So now there's the responsibility of man in why the offense came in the first place. 
So he couples both of them together. Another example is the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. First Peter said, Jesus was delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Those were his words. But then right after that, he says, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. So then there's the responsibility of man in the same exact context. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15.10, the Apostle Paul said, hey, I labored in even more than all of them. Paul says, I, I labored. I, I put in a lot of effort. I, there was discipline in this. But right after that, he says, yet not I, the grace of God with me. So he has these things coupled together. They, they coexist. And of course, we have this verse right here in Philippians, where he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, which is the responsibility of man. And then it is God who is at work within you, both to will and do for his good pleasure, sovereignty of God. And so whether we're talking about salvation or we're talking about sanctification, I, I want us to somehow grab this and hold both of them true to our hearts. The Bible teaches that God is sovereign. So you are responsible and I am responsible. We together are responsible. Um, I was listening to a sermon by uh, Pastor Alistair Begg, and he was just kind of talking about the two views and how the, there's maybe some mistakes that people make when trying to deal with this and understand them. And he said this. He said, the reason that you or I may still live with problems in this area may largely be due to a reluctance on our part to recognize the existence of mystery. Do we, is there a reluctance to recognize that there is an existence of mystery, and to allow God to be wiser than us. Hey, I can accept that one for sure. You know what? At the end of the day, God, you are way wiser than me. He goes on to say, many have the reluctance to submit themselves to the, res to the revelation of Scripture and instead cling to a human logic that says, if I can't understand it, then I won't believe it. I mean, that's, that's what a lot of critics of the Bible have to say. Hopefully, we in the church aren't doing that. And he, he just kind of said this, you know, tongue-in-cheek. Well, I want you to know if that's your answer to the study of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, he goes, then have a good life because you ain't ever going to understand it. And that's just pretty sure that's the reality. There is some form of this, how they coexist together, that our finite minds cannot comprehend. But there's an infinite God who is much wiser than us, and it truly is this mystery, but I can just trust that to this infinite God, that he really does understand it and that it is true. Uh, even Charles Spurgeon was like confronted with this, and they said, Mr. Spurgeon or Pastor Spurgeon, how would you reconcile God's sovereignty and man's responsibility? And he just replied to them, well, I don't need to reconcile friends. And because that's, that's the reality of it. They, they are friends, they act, and they coexist together. They do not contradict as much as it may seem like they do. But in God's wisdom, they work together in unison. And it's just maybe a doctrine that we just have to land on and accept, even if we can't wrap our minds around it. And so this has kind of been debated for thousands of years, so I don't think there's anything super clever that I'm going to say here tonight that's going to make it click. Oh, yeah, great, Pastor Mike, thanks. Like, I'm totally chill with this now. I mean, an element of it, this has to be at peace that we don't get it. As much as I would like to help us all get it the best that we possibly can, there's still going to be an element where it's just going to go, well, I just believe it's true because God said that it's true. I mean, think about that's, in a sense, how we have to approach the Trinity. We have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons, but yet it's just one God, right? So we get the general concept of that, but how do we really go, okay, well, they are three complete, distinctly different persons, but at the same time, they are one cohesive, unified God. It's three, it's separate, but it's one, and like, oh, well, yeah, there's the three-leaf clover. No, be it doesn't work like that. Water and, and gas and what is it, steam or no, water? Ice? Yeah. It's like, well, no, because ice is never water. It's, it's ice, right? They're, the molecules are moving different. Like the, there's a lot of things where like, oh, there's an egg, there's the shell, and then there's the yolk, and then the, the yellow and the white part. Like, man, there's been some really creative things to try to describe the Trinity, but they all fall short, right? Because we just have to just say, you know, Lord, I, somehow or another, the, the Trinity is real. It's a, it's a Biblical doctrines, we see it laid out in the scriptures. And so let's now kind of shift gears a little bit to just focus on then how are we going to apply these verses to our life? It's one thing to have a good theology like we talked about last week. Paul would really want us to have a good theology, but we need to make it practical. We got to just have the head knowledge, and now we're going to want to live it out. And so I have roughly just four things I want to share with you, um, and then that'll be it for the night. 
But notice for the first one, verse 12 says, work out your own salvation. And I underlined that part of my Bible, your own salvation. There's a tendency where we may just get too caught up in looking at other people's lives and worrying about their salvation and worrying about their sanctification and things like that. And we're not focused enough on what God is doing in our own life. I mean, it's real easy to point the finger. And, you know, I have a good friend, Benny Neff, and I'll never forget him. He said, every time you point the finger, you got like three or four more pointing right back at you. And I, my, I don't, my thumb doesn't point back at me, so I don't know how exactly how that works. And what if you point like this? You know, I don't know. But the, the idea is, is like it's sometimes it's, we, we tend to focus on other people's sins and mistakes and wrongdoings more than our own. And while we should care about the sanctification and the salvation of other people, that's why we go out there and share the gospel. Like, it is an important thing. This verse kind of reminds us that let's start by focusing on working out our own salvation first. Right? We have to make sure we worry about the plank in our own eye before we worry about the speck in somebody else's eye. And it might be tempted to think, well, you know, I'm working out my salvation better than so-and-so, and that's just our flesh and our pride getting in the way. And we just try to justify ourselves by comparing ourselves to other Christians. But the Bible really exhorts us and warns us and corrects us not to do that. You know, we, we might look at someone and think we're more spiritual than they are, and that will just lead to complacency where we go, well, man, I'm actually more spiritual and I work out my salvation better than most. And so I don't need to really work out my salvation any more than I currently am. But man, okay, well, when you hold yourself up to the one who's perfectly obedient, Jesus, because that's really what the scriptures say we ought to be comparing ourselves to. He's the perfect standard. Well, then you go, well, actually, I could be working out my salvation a lot better now that I think about it if I compare myself up to him. And so this is what we need to see, that we always want to keep working on our own life and focusing on... Um, not on others as much as we focus on ourselves. That's not to say that, like, as we're reading through the scriptures and we're listening to a message, there's going to be times where God puts a word on our heart for somebody else, and we can share that with other people. We want to encourage. We want to disciple. We want to build each other up. But it's just a big difference of, like, doing it with a critical eye and with a judgmental eye and a self-righteous, prideful eye where, oh, I don't need it, only they need it. That's what we want to watch out for. But it says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So a second mode of personal application, notice verse 12 also says, with fear and trembling, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And that doesn't mean, of course, you probably already know this, you, we don't go about living out our days and following the Lord in this constant state of terror, right? Um, it's like, oh, I better obey God or else he's just going to send me straight to hell. He's going to just rain fire and brimstone off, down upon me and you know, I just, it, it, God's just looking for a reason to zap me if I don't obey, right? So I better work it out with fear and trembling. That's, that's not the application of the verse. When the Bible talks about having fear in God, it's, it's talking about the sense of having a very deep respect for him. That's the fear of the Lord. It's not a trembling that we're scared. It's more of like a trembling that we're in awe of him, right? It's, it's a reverential type of fear. There's a big difference. And so that is... The motivation for why we're doing it is because we're in awe of the Lord and we revere him and we love him. So therefore, we will obey and we'll work out our salvation. Um, the third way we can apply this to our life, verse 2 also says, he goes, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Um, I read a really good quote. I don't even remember who wrote this um, or who said this or where I even found it. But it says, the degree of obedience of a child is not determined by what the child does when the parent is present, but by what he does when the parent is absent. And I think that's a pretty good marker. Like, my, my kids will obey a lot better if I'm in the room, right? They're not perfect. They'll still be boneheads. They, they got my DNA in them, right? Um, but then if I'm not there, and if it's just Alyssa there, then they might slack off a little bit more sometimes. And then if neither one of us are there, then they really just want to push the envelope, right? It's just like the nature of kids. But I feel very blessed that, you know, for the most part, even if we're not there, by God's grace, he did something in their hearts, so they still choose obedience more times than not, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, but that's not always the case with every child. That's not the case with every grown adult, right? And that's Paul's point here, that there's really never a time when the believer is not responsible to the Lord, regardless of who's present or not present. Whether Paul's there or not, there's still a requirement for obedience. And so that means like whether you're at church amongst your fellow believers and 
in front of the pastor and the elders. Like, oh, I just better be on my best behavior. Hello, pastor. Good. How you doing? I was just, you know, on my knees for you in prayer this morning, and I read eight chapters of the Bible for. I was like, okay, well, if that's all true, great. I, I appreciate it. But we don't just have a certain kind of behavior just in front of the pastor. I can't tell you how many times, you know, I, I was around someone and they just start cursing. They go, oh, I'm so sorry, pastor. You know, and then they're like, well. I mean, if, if you feel convicted not to curse, it should be when you're not just around me. It should just be, that should just be your conviction, regardless if a pastor's in the room or not. Um, maybe you're at the mall or on the golf course in front of your Christian friends. You're at work in front of your non-Christian coworkers. Or even if you're at home and you're all thinking alone. This is what Paul's point is. People could be there. People could not be there. But the, at the end of the day, the Lord always is there with us. He sees and he hears every single thing that's going. We are always in front of the eyes of God. And so this is our call, is to be obedient in the Lord's presence because we're always in his presence. Um, my old high school football coach would often say, character is what you choose to do when nobody is watching. That's a really good definition. For, I don't know where he got that, but it stuck with me for almost 20 years now. And uh, that's kind of the go-to definition that I use for character, is it's what you choose to do when nobody is watching. And so my prayer is that we would just choose to obey the Lord and live in a manner worthy of the gospel, as he's talking about here, live in this obedience, uh, whether or not people are watching us. Because our, our heart should be to please God anyway, right? The, the, Paul says that in numerous epistles, that he's not trying to please man, he's trying to, be, he's trying to please the Lord. And everything we do should be under the Lord and not for man anyway. So all of these things tie in together and they cross-reference one another. Um, lastly, another application, by looking at verse uh, 13, Paul says, God is working in us both to will and to work for his good pleasure. There's this element of willing and working. And so some of us might know the right thing. And with that knowledge, we even have the desire where we want to do the right thing. And then there's still this big struggle to be obedient. I've been there, and I assume that you guys could relate with me. And the reality is that deep down inside, we really want to obey ourselves and do our own thing more than we want to obey the Lord. It's not that the, the obedience and the, or the desire to do God's will is absent, but sometimes I just get caught up in the moment and I'm wanting to do my own thing more than I want to obey God. And so whenever that's the case, you know, I also want to take a mind, I want to praise God for verses like verse 13, because we have a promise that God will work inside of us. Right? It's not just left up to me and what my desires are and how I desire my flesh more than God sometimes. God will work inside of us to change our will and to enable us to obey him. There's a help of the Holy Spirit in this. And so I kind of see this play out in two different ways. And it, it kind of go back to this idea of sovereignty of God and man's responsibility, but God working in us, these are the two ways. One, God is sovereign. And so I think there are ways where we're just going to be totally unconscious of the fact that God is working his will into our lives. As we're choosing to abide into him, God is at work, and we don't necessarily are asking for it. We're not like necessarily thinking about it and praying about it in that moment. But the Holy Spirit is in us and changing us. And, you know, sometimes there'll be just this random thought, this random desire. It just comes like seemingly out of nowhere. And that's the Lord at work. Sovereign things happening in our lives. But I think there's another part to this as well where there is a distinct work that God does to change our desires, to want to be more in line with him, only we ask him to do that. Right? I think there's a distinct enabling that happens to please him only when we are consciously crying out and asking for his help. And like in a sense, we're claiming the promise right here of verse 13. Right? God is sovereign. He doesn't want robots. He wants us to take our struggles and our failures before him, he wants us to ask him for help, right? He wants a relationship with us. And so in those moments when we start to struggle to obey Christ, I, a very healthy application, and my encouragement would be to memorize this verse and then come to a spot where we get specific when we pray and then say, Lord, will you please change my desires to be for you? You know, I, I can recognize that I want what I want more than I want what you want in this moment. And I'm tempted by it, and I'm probably I'm about to be caving in. I'm cracking. And, you know, I, I had a, a gentleman at a previous church that I pastored at, and he had a problem with uh, drinking way too much. And he was getting drunk, and he acknowledged that it was sin to be drunk. We just read it in Ephesians. And he, but at the end of the day, he says, but I don't really want to stop doing it because I understand that it's wrong. 
but he didn't have the, he didn't want to stop. And so I said, hey, man, and we read this verse together. I said, part of the prayer is just to say this verse and say, God, I want you to help me to want this, right? Like there, that, that could be, I was like, God, I can confess that I don't want it right now, but I want to want it. And we can bring these very specific things to the Lord and ask for the strength to do the things that please him. And he will work in us and he can change our desires. And part of that is just being honest and forthright with God, and he will honor that prayer, and we'll see this verse come to life. So if we can just humble ourselves and ask God to transform us, get as specific as you can with your request. God will work in that. And then, honestly, the more consistent that we can be, this verse will come to life to us. You know, it, there's this old saying of like, which, you know, there's two dogs in you that drive the passions of your life. I'm sure you've heard this, or maybe you've heard it as wolves and they're fighting each other, and well, which dog is going to win? Well, the one that you feed more often. If you neglect one and you feed the other one, eventually one's going to be strong and attack and overcome the other one. And so there's a, an element of consistency here, of man's responsibility. Say, Lord, I know I struggle with this, but there's hopefully an element of consistency here, and God will honor that. Um, verse 14 says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Right, we can, I think uh, we have a little bit of time for a little bit more. Um, so, but this, this kind of ties into this idea of doing and uh, work, having God work in you to do things for his good pleasure. Well, there's a way in which we ought to do it. And verse 14 kind of clarifies that. We do it without grumbling and we do it without disputing. Other translations will say, do everything without complaining and arguing. So I think there's a very universal application to that. Like some people are just, they complain a lot more than others. They maybe complain about everything in their life. Um, well, God's word says that we shouldn't do that. It's, that's a sin to be complaining. And very clearly here we have that over maybe every aspect of our life. But in the context of us working out our salvation, God doesn't want us to desire spiritual growth and to be abiding into him and, and, and actually obeying his word with a begrudging heart, right? There's an element where it should be this thing where we're doing it with sincerity. That's where the... the the trembling and being in awe and irreverence, uh, in reverence of him comes into play. Uh, like Psalm 100, verse 2, it says, serve the Lord with gladness. And so there's this element where, like, okay, I'm going to work on my salvation, and I'm not just going to be, you know, a poor sport about it, you know, because it, it's going to probably be difficult because as we kind of hold up our own wills and our own temptations and our desires that we were talking about, and when they're not in line with God's will, sometimes it's, it's hard to be humble and go, oh, man, I really got to do that again. Because we don't, our flesh doesn't like God's will at certain times. And if we're actually going to be obedient to the scriptures, we got to do it without grumbling or disputing. Our obedience should look like the apostle John described it in 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. So I will say that like a... A reluctant obedience is better than no obedience at all, right? So I, I would encourage you, even if there's going to be some type of grumbling, complaining, and like you just can't escape that for whatever reason in the moment, it's better to do that and obey rather than like grumbling and complaining or being joyful and then there's just no obedience. Like the obedience should be the top priority and then God will work in us as we do it without the grumbling part. But man, just let God's grace work in our lives where we can obey and obey him joyfully and obey him willingly. That's the heartbeat of what Paul's getting at here. And so verse 14 has many different applications, but it really does have to apply in this element of our spiritual growth. Um, I really plan on like taking a deeper dive into verse 14 and like look at the Greek language of these words. Um, but I think if I start that tonight, it would almost be a whole entire other sermon because like, there's a lot of good ways where we could uh, apply this grumbling and disputing and complaining. And uh, I want to take time for that. But I think what we'll do to that, we'll pick that up next Wednesday and uh, kind of look at the, the Greek in that as well. So for now, we'll just transition to a time of worship, time of communion. Um, we're going to have three more songs to close on tonight. And if you feel it at any time, just please go ahead and go back there and get the elements and uh, take them at your own conviction, your own leisure. Um, but for now, let's end in a closing word of prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word and that it is absolute truth. Even in the times 
maybe like tonight where it's hard to wrap our mind around every single one of these truths. When I look at one verse and I can see one absolute truth, and then I'll look at another verse and I think, man, do I see a different absolute truth? No, Lord, your word is perfectly cohesive. You have a mystery and wisdom that is far beyond whatever our finite minds can imagine. And we just want to entrust your word to you and this, that you would use it in our life in the way that you so see fit. So I, I pray that we're sharpened tonight, but may we also be encouraged in our obedience. Lord, may we be encouraged to fall in love with you and to be as practical doers of your word as we possibly can with a joyful, a loving, reverential heart poured out to you.
Lord, I just want to thank you for tonight. I uh, want to just ask that you uh, give us strength for this week, for the rest of this week, Lord, and um, pray that we can just all drive home safely and have a, a really good night and uh, get to enjoy some more fellowshipping. In your name I pray. Amen. <laughs>